Hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? Doing well. You know where I am? I, your background looks a little different today. It does. I'm at home because of the Snowmageddon 2022. I, I think it got a name. I think it's Winter Storm Landon. At least that's what my Bank of America email told me. They said that they care about me during this winter storm. I don't know if they really do. And I, I've gotten so many emails telling me the 16 places that are not open today that uh, everyone needs to send an email. It's like, oh my gosh. But Winter Storm Landon does not sound quite as terrible as Snowmageddon. So, well, you know, I, so you were working from home today. Uh, I had to come in today uh, for better or worse. I was, um, I had a case I had to do this morning, fracture case. Uh, didn't want to wait on that one. So I braved the snow. I dug my car out from snow. That's the one thing that I think that we really messed up on with the new house is not measuring the garage and realizing that a two-car garage for a 1936 house is not the same as what the expectations you would have for a two-car garage in 2022. Well, I think St. Louis, I don't want to say is unique in this regard, but um, there are a lot of small garages in St. Louis. You know, part of the appeal of St. Louis is the remarkably, I guess, varied, but consistently great architecture in so many neighborhoods with so many cool houses and so many small garages. We actually borrowed a friend's car to try in my old house garage before Talia got her newest car. And this was, you know, five or 10 years ago, whatever just to make sure it would fit. It's just a common problem. But a total afterthought on my part, because even in our old house, when we got a new car, we were, I was totally upgrading my, da my dad life and was getting a Honda Pilot. And I actually didn't think about that before <laughs> we pulled the car in and got home from the dealership. And it narrowly made it. We're talking like half an inch on each side. And I'm like, that probably is something I should have thought about uh, before purchasing this car. <laughs> So you had to get up early, turn the car on, shovel it, shovel it out and scrape it off. And Well, you were kind enough because we were supposed to record very early this morning and you were kind enough to give me an out uh, because I was just, you know, I'm a Florida boy. I was very nervous about the weather this morning and, you know, I'm, everything and like you, my schedule is usually pretty efficiently packed and I know exactly what time I need to leave my house to get to you know, the location I'm going to get into, you know, to the holding area for before a case. And it was completely blown to hell this morning, uh, just because I had to get up and you know get up uh, earlier to did my normal morning routine. So I worked out, and then I had to shovel snow around, push snow off my car. I mean, I looked ridiculous out there because I was like, you know, it would work really well here to get the snow off the top of my car, a broom. So I had like a, one of those side sidewalk, you know, sweeping things and just like sweeping the the snow off, starting the car going back in and then uh and then of course there were unfortunately some distressed motorists along the way on forest park parkway um so yeah everything just slowed to a halt did you wave at them when you drove by them or did you uh <laughs> no i'm a florida driver like my hands are like 10 and 2 the whole time definitely you know white knuckling the whole thing <laughs> amen that's what happened when i drove to work yesterday i am my wife laughs at me because i oh, i told her to make sure her car is a full tank of gas and i I ended up driving my car, which was good, but uh, oh, it's so funny. We are late. But yeah, you know, Talia grew up in the Northeast, so this is like nothing to her, right? That's right. That's exactly right. I will say working from home is interesting. You know, I work most weekends, you know, a good chunk of the day or mornings at least or whatever. Um, and I'm home today because I had a big case cancel and I just had meetings the rest of the day and it's fine. And I started off today great, but now it's like usually on a Saturday or Sunday at about noon or 1230, I'm thinking about a nap. And uh, that's not built into my schedule today. So I yeah. got to stay, stay focused. I tell Karen for your work from home days uh, to build in a little bit of a, you know, genius time, uh, you know, you know, to sleep and catch up. Uh, I find that when I work from home, uh, there's just a lot more snack breaks. <laughs> it's the problem for me. So that too, that too. But yesterday, yesterday I had a, a Zoom, a, a bunch of Zooms that I had to do just because I was supposed to be doing academic stuff. And I did, but I had to tell my, my kids, these are times when I can absolutely not be disturbed versus you can make an appearance on screen if it helps keep the peace. Uh, so, and, and I'm, I'm very proud of myself. My father-in-law, um, got through the day with only one hour of television yesterday for the kids. Uh, and that was when I had a deposition when I just definitely could not be involved. One of my, you know, patient is involved in a work comp thing. So I was trying to help out, but uh, I was like, yeah, TV's totally fine during that one hour. Yeah. You're, oh, I think your only mistake, so what I've heard about your day so far 
is getting your normal workout in. So I did not work out. I don't usually get up early to work out, but I'm planning to shovel snow this afternoon. Once it stops oh, that's, snowing. That's the, two, that's the two-a-day situation. My wife actually <laughs> last night was like, so what's our snow shoveling plan? I was like, what it normally is? I do it when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Uh, well played. Yes. So I, speaking of uh, white substances, I had an interesting case in which uh, I wanted to ask your opinion um, because I had a patient who, um, you know, came into the clinic. Uh, she's in her 50s, 60s ish, and um, she had the classic, you know, dorsal central wrist pain and the classic dorsal wrist swelling. And I was like, I came in the room, I was like, oh, you got a slack wrist, just not even looking at the x rays. Um, and we talked about treatment options um, and we got her x rays, and she has a slack wrist. Um, but of course, she doesn't remember any injury. And, you know, I, I thought her capital lunate joint didn't look great. Um, so I was really hoping just to do a PRC. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we had talked about, you know, in the setting of her capitate base not looking good, that we probably would have to do a four-corner fusion. Um, so how do you talk through that decision-making process uh, with a patient? You know, I know some people are more willing to accept uh, a little bit of wear on the capitate. Uh, and some people are even putting in little pillows of uh, tissue in there to help uh, smooth that new articulation. Uh, remind me how old she is? Uh, 50, 60s. Okay. Yeah, it's, so it's super interesting. And I, and I think some of the audience hopefully will uh, shout at us on Twitter or uh, write us an email on their opinions. Because to me, there's three options. Uh, there's got to be a number, Chris. There's always one, two, or three options. There's three options. Uh, you usually stick with two. So uh, <laughs> I'm proud of you for expanding. <laughs> My emails are largely reading the same way, by the way, lately. I <laughs> <laughs> I guess when we get old, we get comfortable with ourselves. So three options. Uh, number one is a four-corner fusion. And uh, just to hit on that, I like the operation. I think results are reliably good. I think literature in the last few years has shown that uh, PRC, honestly, is better. It's more reliable, less frequent revision surgery. Um, so I, I do like PRC better in the right population, but I like the four-corner fusion. So we can talk more about that if you like. The other two options are the capsular interposition, which I am not convinced there's any literature on that's substantial, um, but basically taking a dorsal capsular flap and you can base it proximally, you can base it distally, and then you carefully uh, suture it into the volar wrist capsule without taking too big a bite with that median nerve proximity, flexor tendon proximity. And uh, I've been happy with that as well. I don't do that often, but I've done that and I think the third potentially really intriguing operation, which I know at some sites has gotten more and more utilization is the capitate resurfacing, um, which I have not done, but I remain intrigued by it and hope, hope to do it at some point. What would be the right patient for you in terms of the capitate resurfacing? The patient you just described, 60 some odd year old where maybe a smoker, um, that you really don't want to do a four bone fusion on and resurfacing the capitate might feel better than a capsular in your position. So we, we talked about options. Um, we told her, you know, this is possible, you know, PRC possible, uh, four corner fusion. And even if her lunate didn't look great, uh, possible total wrist arthrodesis. Um, mm -hmm. so I don't have any experience with a capsular interposition. I have not done any capitate uh, resurfacing. So that was the list I was offering her. Um, and we go to the operating room and you know, I elevated my capsular flaps and I see a, speaking of snow, white chalky substance. So, and then there's complete dissociation between a scaphoid and a lunate. Uh, what do you make of that? Um, well, I guess I have two follow-up questions. Um, one is, have you given her steroid injections and would you consider that on her first visit to the office? I.e., is that the chalky substance or are we talking something else? Nobody's given her a steroid shot. I actually offered her and walked out of the room with the impression I was giving her a steroid shot. When I came in to give her a shot, she said, you know, I don't want that. Let's just, let's just cut to the chase. So I said, okay, here are the options. Okay. Uh, and I, so I was fully prepared to do that, but nobody else had given her a steroid shot. Yeah. So, um, you know, most likely this is gout. Um, uh, I guess potentially a pseudo gout, but probably gout. And we, you know, we did share our experience. It's been a long time, maybe 15 years ago on this, on this subject. And I think it's, it's the culprit. I mean, I, I don't think this is, you know, a trauma and gout. I think it's gout that has eaten away the scapulonate ligament and led to arthrosis. 
Um, doesn't change my treatment or my approach, uh, but I think it's gout. My second question, and we can talk about that too, gout and assessment and what it means, but my second question for you is, I guess this is a theoretical question. So you say you've never done a capsular interposition. What's the role of, you know, I know that for you, you know, nerve is, is really everything, not everything, but really important to your practice. Like me, sports and congenital and kids, really super important. What, it's interesting, you know, do we do enough as a partner, as a group of partners that we operate together on things like this? You know, I think, I think that's interesting. Um, you know, if it was a problem where I didn't think that we each had reliable solutions, while it may not be the solution that everybody else comes to, um, I think there's enough equipoise in the literature, meaning that there's a lot of uncertainty as to what the right thing to do is, but you've got a number of things that have reliable and predictable options. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess if, if there was somebody who felt very strongly that capsular interpositions are the way to go, maybe I should have called that person. Um, and I, maybe that's an area where we could be better at it. Um, but I think that these are reasonable solutions that many um, hand surgeons in practice would have offered this patient. Totally agree. And I'm not suggesting you didn't do absolutely the right thing. Yeah, yeah, you were. Yeah, you were. You totally, that's no, what you were doing. Time. I, I do that. I do that <laughs> enough. Not this time. No, I agree. There's not clearly a better answer. And you certainly had the right tools in your toolbox to, uh, to take care of this. So, so I mean, I'm in agreement. I think this is a very reasonable option. I might have chosen a capsule center position, but not with the idea that uh, there was anything wrong with escape or excision and four bone fusion. Can you give anybody any pearls about a capsular in a position before we dive into other technical things? I, you know, I used to do a blat capsulodesis a lot for scaphalunate. And so with that operation, you are creating a one and a half centimeter wide capsular flap. So dorsal wrist capsule based on the radius. And then you attach it to the scaphoid distally. I don't do that operation anymore. I'm not sure if you do capsulodesis, but I don't remember the last time I did that. Um, in this case, I actually like a distally based flap better, and I make it at least two centimeters wide. So essentially, a longitudinal incision kind of in the radial one third of the, uh, of the wrist joint, another longitudinal incision in the ulnar one third of the wrist joint, and then I take the capsule off of the radius, leave it attached distally. So now I have a white, a nice, wide, substantial capsular flap that then I can suture, as I mentioned, carefully to the volar ligamentous structure. I do like the operation. Um, I have no idea if it stands the test of time, uh, but I have not revised any of these in my practice. Not that I've done more than half dozen to a dozen. Same indications as the capitate resurfacing, this kind of patient? I think so. I think so. Certainly far cheaper. I don't know what the capitate resurfacing costs, uh, it might be more fun in the operating room, but I don't know about cost uh, analysis for that. Sur surgeon enjoyment is not included in our uh, case logs <laughs> with cost. I, it's, interesting you mentioned, it's interesting you mentioned the capsulodesis because I actually raised a blat capsulodesis uh, flap as part of an SL reconstruction case because I knew I wasn't going to be able to uh, reconstruct the SL ligament. And I actually wanted the trainee to see. Here's how you would do this in case you don't have access to various, uh, you know, implants like a suture tape or something like that. Um, but the suture tape, I think for me has supplanted the use of the blat. Um, but it's important to know how to do a blat in case you need to bail yourself out. Yeah. And, you know, it, as you mentioned, I mean, there's many ways to accomplish the same goal. What, what is probably not super healthy is sometimes we have a little bit of group think, I think for the right reasons, but uh, like you say, we're, we've been pretty happy with the internal brace for SL and we've been very, very happy for the internal brace for um, CMC. And I did an LRTI yesterday and Harrison, uh, one of our fellows was super excited because uh, he hadn't seen a lot of LRTIs, which is fascinating. And we, you know, it was great. And we did it together. I don't know if there's anything tricky about it, but uh, it, it was fun for him to see. Right. But because if you go into a practice where you're at a surgery center and they say, why are you spending this much money on a surgery? Um, you know, it's going to make a difference because you could do an LRTI on the cheap um, using an FCR and, or various, the Wildby or the, um, you know, the technique that Jeannie uh, Del Signore described. There are a lot of ways you can treat thumb CMC arthritis in a very cost-effective manner. Absolutely. And I'm not here to promote anything, but uh, we have two papers coming out on this, which I'm excited about. One's a retrospective 
study on a large number of LRTI versus uh, the internal brace and another's a prospective study. So those data will be interesting. Uh, I'll give teasers as we go along. Oh, I bet people are on the edge of their seats <laughs> during their commutes. So well, let's get to let's get to the meat of this episode. So I wanted to talk uh, detail surgical technique about four corner fusions, um, just because I know there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, you know, in essence, so say for example, you've gotten your surgical approach done. You're staring at a bare spot on the capitate. Um, the lunate proximal surface where it articulates with the radius is okay. Um, you've decided you're going to do a four corner fusion. How do you prepare your joint surfaces just to get started? I would like, with your permission, to go back and, and emphasize two things. One, the approach for me is simply through the third compartment. Uh, I transpose and leave the EPL transpose. I do not routinely take out the posterior osseous nerve, but don't have any issue if, if you know others might. Uh, I'm really about just states. just don't bill for it separately. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. I'm all about the nerves. I'm going to save them. Um, yeah, I don't believe in billing for them, but some some out there will. I, I know some that's do. True. Some do. That's cool. And to be very clear, you know, one of our favorite studies is Kirk Watson's study of uh, defining slack wrist and apparently reviewing 4,000 radiographs of various wrist arthritis patterns. The proximal lunate is always okay. Um, uh, you always with a little until asterisk. it's until it's not, <laughs> until it's not. <laughs> but it's always okay. But you do have to confirm that. So so um, wide exposure, and then the first step is obviously removing the scaphoid. In these situations with a little bit older patients and um, patients who've been in pain for a while, it's usually not the hardest part of the procedure. You know, there may be some scarring of the scaphoid tuberosity to the volar capsule, um, but getting some homens around the scaphoid to me is the simplest way to get the scaphoid out. I don't use threaded K-wires. I don't think they're necessary. I am super careful about the volar capsule, especially the radioscaphoid capitate and log radiolunate ligaments, because if those are cut, you will see translocation of the carpus. But getting the scaphoid out is the first step, usually not so hard. I, I agree with that. And I think the last point you made about the RSC and making sure that you don't get that ulnar translation of your carpus is huge. Uh, and for that reason, um, you know, it, it is largely a blunt uh, dissection to release the scaphoid on the volar side. I like to use a McGlamory elevator uh, from the foot world. Um, and I seem that, that that seems to work well for me. I just don't like taking a knife and going along the volar surface there, because I think you can get into trouble uh, there for, uh, for a number of reasons. So yeah, I agree. Usually not the hardest part. Uh, are you the kind of guy that likes to take the scaphoid out in one piece? Is that a pride point for you? I'm the kind of guy who wants to get the scaphoid out fast. And <laughs> <laughs> if it's in one piece, awesome. But no, there is no requirement there. Do you ever split it from the beginning? No, I actually don't split it. Um, I, I think the question is, I, I like the uh, you know dissection near circumferentially, grab it with the biggest runger I have, and then the slow alligator roll, and it either comes out or you hear that snap, and then you got two pieces. What <laughs> With do you the do? biggest rounder, it might be more than two pieces. I tried. I actually just heckle the trainees until uh, um, it's no longer possible for them to take it out in one piece, and then I make it into multiple pieces so they don't feel bad. It's kind of how it goes usually. Do Do you care if there's a little um, shell of scaphoid volarly? Uh, that's scarred to the capsule. Do you do you meticulously work to get that those fragments of bone? No, out? I mean it, it hurts my ego a little bit. Um, I think, in at least in orthopedics, we're all guilty of trying to make X-rays look a little bit better sometimes uh, unnecessarily. But no, I mean at that point, you know, it's more about moving on to the next part of the case because I don't think think that little volar shell is going to make a big difference. I will try to get it if it's in the field, but I, I don't endeavor. Totally agree. Totally agree. So, are you a keep the traquetrum and truly do a four bone fusion? Have you transitioned to uh, take out the traquetrum? Do you fuse the traquetrum? What's your strategy? I will keep the traquetrum. I will try to do a, um, a fusion of the capital lunate uh, for sure. And then if I can get the traquetrum and the hamate together, uh, if it presents itself very easily to me, I will debris, denude those surfaces, um, the triquetrum and the hamate. But if it is not presenting itself very easily, they will just be um, held by a compression screw. Um, I think technically, yes, you should really try to get those surfaces, but I don't think it's worth uh, extra, um, a ton of extra effort during the case. How, yeah, do you, so what do you, how do you think about it? Yeah, I agree. A while back, uh, the St. Louis group and the Memphis group 
uh, led by Jim Calandruccio and Dr. Government, looked at this, this uh, capital lunate only fusion with removal of the scaphoid and removal of the trachytrum. And at the time, the results were not better and probably were a little worse than just a four bone fusion. So we didn't really go in that direction as a group. Uh, my general philosophy is, you know, it's all about the capital lunate. In a patient with gout, though, I do worry about the ligaments, you know, the LT and others. And so I will, my general procedure is fuse the capital lunate, and then I try to place a screw triquetrum hamate capitate. Uh, that's through a separate, separate ulnar sided incision where I protect the sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. And I've been really happy with this. And, you know, there are occasional rare non-unions, but I've been really happy with it. Do you, um, do you think that a non-union of that joint really matters? Of the... Triquetro uh, ham eight? No. And I certainly have never seen a broken screw or never seen pain. When, I've, when I have pain afterwards, it is more at the uh, foveal area, kind of ulnar wrist, not related to triquetro ham eight. So here, here's a, uh, here's a uh, I guess I read my mind question. What's the hardest part of the procedure for you? And maybe I'll go first. The hardest part of the, the easiest part of the procedure for me is denuding the proximal capitate. The hardest part of the procedure is denuding the distal lunate. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because when I came up the other day, I, I told the trainee that you're going to do the capitate. I'll do the lunate because I'm never satisfied with anybody else doing the lunate. And I'd rather, and I said, I, I told the trainee, I said, the lunate disappears relatively quickly if you're too aggressive. And I'd rather that be me than you. It's, it's hard to get good cancellous bone on that distal lunate. And you can do a crappy cartilage resection and have that subcortical bone, but if it doesn't heal, that's why. And so you mm -hmm. really, that is, does need to be done precisely. It's also why our partner, Lindley Wall, uh, believes strongly that for even for total wrist arthrodeses, we should take out the proximal row. I don't think she's wrong. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard surface to get the fuse and clearly the capitate is an easier surface to work with. And in that setting, the, obviously the radius is, is relatively easy to work with. Um, you know, I think that it, it is frustrating uh, how long it takes to do the lunate. Uh, I try not to get out the power tools, um, but I think inevitably for the lunate, I have to get out the burr. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't do it very often, probably less frequently than you because I like it less than you, but uh, occasionally I'll get it out. Otherwise, it's just rangeur curette, rangeur curette, a few F-bombs, rangeur curette. I was going to say just a few, huh? So I think the hardest part of the case actually for me is once you've taken down that mid-carpal joint, and I think we talked about this on a prior episode, once you take down the mid-carpal joint and then you're trying to fuse the lunate to the capitate, and I like to use a headless compression screw. So you're trying to get that headless compression screw kind of right mid-axial um, on the lunate, kind of right at the most uh, proximal part of that uh, concave surface, um, or excuse me, convex surface. So that then when you try to flex the wrist in order to do that, you end up flexing through the capital lunate joint that you just prepared. Um, so how do you guard against that? I, th I think you're right. That is technically the hardest part. And the more severe the arthritis, i.e. the more dorsal intercalated, uh, you know, lunate dorsiflexion. So sorry, I said that very awkwardly. The more the lunate is tilted dorsally, the harder that is. And so my, my sequence of steps... Uh, which is certainly not foolproof, but I've been pretty happy with it, is get the uh, cartilage uh, denuded from the proximal capitate, the distal lunate. I then flex uh, the wrist to try to get the lunate back in a neutral posture and then get the capital lunate joint aligned in flexion. And then I place a derotation or a static K-wire away from where a planned screw is and then, you know, usually you can extend the wrist or so you're manipulating the capital lunate joint to place a temporary K wire. And then you can flex the capital lunate. Then you can flex the wrist with the capitate secured to the lunate and place your longitudinal K wire. To me, it's that derotation wire, which is everything. I think to get to that step, though, can also sometimes be challenging. I agree 100 percent that putting that extra wire in is, is critical. Um, do you ever use a point of reduction clamp or anything like that to, to hold the capital lunate joint compressed while you put in that derotational wire and while you put in your headless compression screw? No, uh, the only time, and I'd love to hear your technique if you do, the only time I've used a point of reduction clamp is when uh, the capitate is shifted in a radial direction. 
and you need to reduce the capillinate joint in that plane as well. So the, the capitate needs to shift ulnarly and the lunate needs to flex a little bit. And so for when I have both of those situations, I have used the pointed reduction clamp. Tell me how you use it. Uh, pretty similarly. I mean, I think that uh, it's something that is useful at times, but again, you know, you don't want your, you don't want to bugger up that lunate surface. Uh, too much. I like it once you've put in your derotational wire to use the proximal tine and not so much park it on the cartilage surface of the lunate, but then pull it up against that K wire and then clamp it distally um, at the, uh, the, the CMC joint um, and use that to just hold a little extra compression. I think for the maneuver that we were talking about to try and get the capital lunate joint reduced, what I've found is if you have an extra set of hands, if somebody else is, is assisting you, instead of having them pull traction and flex through the, you know, essentially by grabbing the hand, I have them just pull some gentle traction. And then I, when I'm looking down the radial lunate joint, I will take a home in or something and just kind of pull the, put the lunate where I want it. Um, and then I'll put my um, rot derotational wire and then things seem just to kind of fall into place. But I find that doing, correcting the lunate rather than trying to, uh, correcting the lunate uh, by manipulating it proximally rather than trying to work from distal to proximal is, is the way that I've gotten around that. Yeah, the only other pearl I have, I, I like that. Um, the only other pearl I would say is that sometimes taking off the dorsal uh, lip of the lunate or the volar lip of the lunate uh, and releasing volar scar between the lunate and the volar capsule can help mobilize the lunate and help with this process. Um, but the key is that you do need to get the capital lunate alignment. And that's tricky uh, at times, especially when the bone's osteopenic, because then you have to be careful not to place right. that temporary KYR2 dorsal or your screw two dorsal, because then you'll, right. you'll break the lunate and then you got real trouble. Oh yeah, that's the, and that's the thing that we were obviously were worried about in this uh, patient with not great bone. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, the point of making sure that the lunate is out of extension, out of its dorsiflex position and, and getting that to correct and then making sure the capital lunate joint is appropriately reduced and not flex through the capital, you know, the capitate isn't flexing down. Also super important. Um, do you typically put uh, any Cancellus autograft in there? Um, and when do you put that in? I found that I need to remind myself to put that in before I do my derotational pin because I don't want to open that thing up again. I usually do. Uh, I simply just take some Cancellus bone from the distal radius. I think the morbidity is near zero. Um, and I believe it makes me feel better, whether it statistically increases the chance of healing or not. I don't know, but I almost always do. Yeah, no, I, I almost always do. And especially in a, a patient who's probably going to have a harder time with bone healing, I, I was telling the trainee that I, I honestly am going to feel better about it because if it doesn't fuse and I didn't put in the autograft, uh, I'll wish that I had. Um, and like you said, minimal morbidity. I make an incision kind of like you, just proximal and radial to listers to keep myself away from the EPL. Essentially ends up being underneath the second compartment um, and making a small window and shelling out as much uh, cancellus as we need. Love it. So you and I both put two screws in, mainly, uh, you know, lunate to capitate and trachytrum to hamate or trachytrum to hamate to capitate. Yeah, no, I like um, if I can, if I can make it work, I like that kind of uh, where they converge at the tip uh, at the distally at the capitate. But I, if it's not going to work out, it's not going to work out. I prep the trachytrum hamate surface if it's within my field. If it's not, I don't go nuts. Um, I used to routinely make a separate uh, incision like you described. I think if you can get it from within your dorsal approach, great. Sometimes you need to make a separate capsular incision kind of over by the fifth compartment um, just to sneak in. And sometimes that's nice because then you're working underneath the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve as opposed to uh, making a new skin incision and going on top of it. Nice. I haven't done that, uh, but that is a nice tip. That's a nice tip. Well, I remember when I was a, a trainee, uh, Ryan Calfee does it exactly the way that uh, you described. And then I was doing one and I had made my small counter incision and I was with the fellow and so, oh, yeah, this is how Dr. Calfee does it. And then they're like, no, Dr. Calfee doesn't do it that way. I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, Dr. Calfee just does it all through the dorsal incision. So then I said, Ryan, I was like, hey, what, what, what changed? Because that's how you taught me. He's like, oh, yeah. You know, I just one day, I just like thought that, you know, you could just, I heard it at a meeting. You just go through that dorsal incision. I was like, oh, yeah. Okay. So now we're changing. Cool. All right, maybe I learned something here today. Thank you. <laughs> but if you are going to go through that um, uh, through a separate incision, one thing that is nice, if you can find the right sized angiocath, that can be a nice little protector 
um, for your guide wire, um, just so you feel like it, unless you make a bigger incision and really dissect out that nerve, um, using a small ANJ cap can be a nice uh, protector um, as you're drilling. For sure. The benefit of going from the ulnar, a separate small ulnar incision is that that gives you the best chance to really get all three bones with that screw. Um, if you think that's important, I don't think anyone would, would say that is the most important feature of your screw. Right. And also because of the, the, the angle at which you're inserting the screw, you're going to get more central in terms of the sagittal plane, in terms of not being too bowl or not being too dorsal. It will put the screw exactly, you'll have the opportunity to put the screw exactly where you want to biomechanically. Yeah, exactly. I do close dorsal capsule um, and I tend to immobilize for six weeks. What about you? I close the dorsal capsule. I immobilize a treaty like a fusion. Uh, you know, I think maybe I immobilize too long, I think based on talking to others, but uh, I have seen these fail. Um, you know, fortunately not mine, but I have seen them fail. So um, that is one thing that I'm concerned about. Um, and I think that's one important preoperative consideration in terms of talking to patients about the, sur the surgical options. The fact they're gonna have to heal a fusion. You mentioned earlier, you know, talking about difficulties with bone healing. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you have any experience using plates for this? Because I know that's a newer technique that has uh, gotten some airplay. Uh, it's a newer technique that's an older technique. Um, and so these circular plates were- Old around. technique with new plates? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the industry and uh, surgeons are always looking for a way to make things easier, which I'd be grateful for. And certainly the approach is, is very simple. And we used to use a circular plate and those kind of fell out of favor. I have not used the newer plates. I'm pretty happy with the uh, headless compression screw. Um, of course, the issue with the original plates, the, the circular plates was they would impinge with dorsiflexion and further limit your ability to extend the wrist, which is a, a big issue. So you have to recess them appropriately if that's your technique of choice. When was the last time you used one of those? Uh, I've taken out a couple in the last few years. I probably hadn't put one in in 15 years. Yeah, I think that impingement risk is real. Um, obviously, the goal is to preserve whatever motion you can. You're already taking one joint surface away or a couple, you know, the, basically the mid carpus away. So preserving what you can is super important. And what do you quote patients as far as motion? So if they come in and, and she's got a wrist that's sore and I, I don't know, maybe her motion is 50-50, you know, 50 of extension, 50 flexion pre-op. What do you tell her she's going to have post-operatively? Half, half of what she's got pre-op, post-op. And I think that doesn't set the bar too high, doesn't set the bar too low. Um, but people have been pleasantly surprised how well people will do. I mean, there's a number of, you know, the classic um, decision-making between PRC and four-corner fusion, which I think has been debunked recently, was that four corner fusion is um, going to be better for strength and not as great for motion and vice versa, meaning a PRC is gonna be better for motion, not as great for strength. That being said, there are a number of um, very reasonable studies that have demonstrated that grip strength is still pretty good after a PRC and that motion is still fairly good after a four corner fusion. Uh, I think um, if uh, one thing is that, you know, really if patients rely on um, a certain range of motion for different exercises or different um, vocational things that they need to do, that may make a difference in terms of how you decide which surgery to offer them. Yeah, totally agree. Um, all right. I love it. I'll send all so, my four corners to you. <laughs> Maybe I'll find a new plate to use. No, I, I like, I like the technique that uh, we described. And if, if anybody else has any, you know, additional pearls, um, please feel free to share them. Uh, email handpodcast at gmail.com. And Chuck, we have to end on a win. Can you give us a win? You want to know my win, Chris? I'll tell you. What's your win? I played meteorologist for our department this week and <laughs> was trying to figure out when we were going to be open and when we were going to be closed. And we didn't get it exactly right, but uh, I, I was pretty happy. We had a good conversation and uh, got it kind of right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for getting it kind of right. Uh <laughs> what about you? Uh, my win was honestly just getting to work today. <laughs> just shit in the snow. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend anything else. It was a source of stress this morning. I was like, I think I could do this. And I, did, I did. I did. You know, when I saw, I logged in the Epic this morning and I, on the, my phone because uh, I was on call last night and I saw that my patient had made it in. I was like, all right, good. <laughs> as long as the patient's there, I'm going in. So, all right. So we'll catch up next time. Awesome. Thank you.